CLI on a cross-platform IDE for C and C++. Download now. Hello. Thank you for coming. Really appreciate it. Um, yeah, so Go invited me to speak. And I wanted to speak about something that's been on my mind for quite a while now. And it's with the current state of programming education. How many of you have seen questions where it's, if someone's asked, what language should I learn? How many people have actually asked those questions? OK, just me. Fair enough. No problem. Well, I find that most tutorials tend to just teach you how to use a technology. They'll teach you how to use Python, Java, React, whatever it is. But they don't actually teach you the skill you're learning when you program. And that is really how to solve problems or thinking in itself. So I'll come back to this. But really, programming is about building a map of a problem space or something you're trying to solve. It's not about the act of coding itself. Saying that would be like saying that writing is about writing. It doesn't make sense. You can sit down at a desk and write, but what do you do? Well, I'll go straight into it. So let's say we have a scenario. Let's say uh, you have a problem where you need to model uh, different events or jobs or things that happen, and it's, it's, all, it's all in your head, and it's a bit confusing. You don't know what's going on, and you have this mental model, which is like a half-baked idea of the problem and wh what is actually going on, right? This, isn't actually, this is more like a pre-model. There's no names yet, but there's just things happening. So you decide, you know what, right, pipeline. We need a pipeline. We have users that trigger jobs, which have things that happen, processes that happen, an effect that occurs, and then some kind of event happens. You know, great. Sounds amazing. So what do we do? Translate that into code. So we start off, we have a you know, high-level flow. Uh, this is, I think this is more of a C++ conference. So for those who don't know, this is a pedantic object, so a data model. So you have a job, we decide we have a job, and a job has an ID and a type and all this stuff, right? So it's pretty great, we write it, it's going along well. But what happens? Well, new requirements come along. So for instance, let's say we want to be able to retry a job, or maybe we want to be able to actually understand what is going on. Now, this doesn't actually fit into our existing model of the problem, because we just have a job object that is encapsulated and it's processed, and different functions that are called along. So how do we actually fit this into our current model? Being able to understand why things fail and how to retry a job in itself. Well, what we could do is, you know, look in at our existing uh, problem, or the system rather, which I've showed you very quickly, purposefully. Um, we can see that, you know, you have uh, API re receives requests. Uh, let's see if I can turn on the laser pointer real quick. Here we go. API receives some kind of request, some logic occurs, some data saved, whatever. But someone looks at logs here. So we can decide, OK, well, there's logs that are being emitted by our jobs which are being processed. Maybe we could use these to trigger a whole new request, a whole new bit of logic to run and to go through again. Whereabouts would this fit in here? Doesn't really fit anywhere. Maybe we could have like a, some kind of a, a retry here. OK, writing on this is a bit ambitious. Uh, we have some kind of retry around here, and then we loop back, and then we go back to the, to the start. Don't know. It's a bit, bit sketchy. So going forward, let's say we try to incorporate that. Well, we can start trying to read our logs to see what's going on with our problem. If it's failed, try to read the logs, pass it, and then just retry it, just time it out. Alternatively, tracking retries, we could use that uh, data dictionary we have on our data model, so we could store the state ourselves. Really messy, because we're just shoving retry logic into something that's not built for it, which is our job data. So now data means anything that we forgot to model. What we've done is we've in invented a workaround, not a system, and we're one typo away from bugs. So the problem here is that logs are not structure, they're leakage. We have logs, but they're not part of our system. They're like receipts floating around in the wind and we're trying to grab them and, oh, what's going on here? We need to throw it here and put it in there. Doesn't work. If you need to grep logs to understand retry history, you don't have a model, you have noise. You can build a dashboard, you can have alerts, but that's just compensating because when you don't model something, you'll you're pay for it everywhere else. This is where engineering really begins. And this is one of the problems we face as software engineers. The fact that software is not constrained by physics. Say you're building a bridge. You have the laws of physics which keep you honest. Reality doesn't push back in software. Things just break loudly in physical systems, whereas in software, broken models just go unnoticed. So you build over the cracks. In our case, that is trying to grip the logs and identify what's going on. That's not engineering. 
That's firefighting. So what do we do? We can make retry a first class citizen. If something matters, make it real in your system. So make a retry object. You have a, again, job ID, reason that it failed, all that sort of stuff. But now we actually have a concept. We have a thing, it's in a box. We can model it, we can reference it, store it. We can reason about it. If something matters and it's not modeled, it's invisible. Once visible, you can build with it. So in the odd way, in our scenario, we'd have to you know, read the logs and then do some string stuff. In Python it has counts, so you can look for the count of a string. Well, now we could actually just have some nice retry objects. We have our concept encapsulated in a single object. Once you model it, you gain leverage. And you can ask real questions. What calls the retries? How often is it a network issue? This concept propagates everywhere. Dashboards, alerts, analytics. But then it begins to hit you that really your assumptions shape your code. And our assumptions here were too shallow. Most bugs don't come from bad logic. They come from bo broken assumptions because really programming is philosophy in disguise. Again, this quote, the map is not about the territory. I'll explain it to you literally first. Say you're going somewhere, you look at a map. We know obviously that the map is not the direct. The, our map is a description of reality in of itself. You might try to go somewhere, GPS takes you down a road that doesn't actually exist, right? And this again applies here to programming as well because this quote isn't about programming, it's about modeling, but it's about modeling what we believe and what actually happens because those two things are rarely the same. Programming at its core is about building models that try to bridge that gap. Additionally, Every model is wrong, but some are useful. A model is a simplification of reality. It's a, if I put my AI hat on, I would call a model a representation of reality itself, a description. But the wrong simplification creates blind spots and blind spots break things. This is the overall theme of the talk I really want to get across to you all, is that programming is about modeling reality. And you, you come across different concepts such as design patterns, domain-driven design, test-driven development, thought audits, and contracts or invariants. These aren't tools in itself, in, in of itself, that you don't just pull them out and you know, open up your toolbox and use it. These things frame the way that you think about your problem space. These aren't tools, they're mental strategies. And they're not for machines, they're for you, specifically. Design patterns, we're choosing to model reality in terms of common problems and common solutions. Domain-driven design. Really, I'm talking specifically about what you choose to model in your code and what you choose to to label it as and how you use it and how you compose it as well. Other things I'll go into some more later. So, naming is modeling. Names make your thoughts visible. Again, you're not writing for a machine, you're writing for other programmers. You're writing for future you. Good code reflects clear thought. For instance, here we have a send function with, that takes in some data and then it pulls out a type inside data and two as well. It's not really clear what it is, what we could do instead is we could actually wrap it in an object. We could call that a notification object. Suddenly we have send notification, notification type to notification two. All of these ideas are now unloaded in your, in your brain whenever you read this code. Names are handles for ideas, really. I think no boilerplate said that, great channel, Ross channel, sorry. <laughs> Wrapping things in models gives them identity, shape and reuse. Good names compress clarity. Here, for instance, a very simple example, you have a function that checks your access, single if statement on its own, or you could put a label on each condition within that if statement, is admin, is owner. Suddenly, this makes more sense. The logic hasn't changed at all, but the thought became re uh, visible. Naming lets you see your reasoning. Names give clarity, models give shape. Once it has a name, give it a shape. Once something is named, you can shape it into a class, a type, a function. This shape gives you leverage. This is where design begins. Because overall, the essence of programming is composition. Composition is proof of clarity. It's about processing small, clear thoughts and juggling them and trying to fit them all together. If I have any kind of raw state I have to pass around, say a dictionary with certain keys I tend to access, I'll just wrap that in an object itself because it gives it more shape. I can reason about it. I can pass it. I can test it. The essence of programming isn't programming itself, as weird as it may be to say, but programming is only a small part of the picture. Again, 
if you're researching, you don't just read the words on the page, you construct an idea in your head using the words that you've read. So, to think like a programmer overall, model your domain. Names, types, concepts. I'm sure at work, if you asked anyone, I'm probably very particular, overly particular about what I call things. Some of you may relate. But to me, it makes a lot of sense being very precise in what you name and, and what you call things. Making your ideas testable as well. Again, you have this mental model of reality in your head. Unlike a bridge, which falls under gravity, you can actually, you have to build those loops for yourself, ways to actually check your ideas and whether they're valid. So that's where test-driven design will fall in, contracts, assertions, that sort of stuff. Again, with the composition, structuring thought itself, patterns, invariants, and feedback, and iterating overall. Iterate and evolve your code. It's that always that same loop, test, break, refine, repeat. Clarity gives you options, options give you power. Debugging thought, what does that really mean? I'm talking about thought audits. So are you really thinking correctly? Are you thinking straight? Questions like, what did I expect to happen? What actually happened? And what was I assuming? This works for everything, actually. This isn't just a principle that just applies to software. You can do this with anything that you learn or anything that you think about, really. And that's really just what rubber duck debugging is. You are essentially pulling out your sense of self and you're taking a step back and you're looking at the way you think. Because when you speak, you're thinking. Speaking is putting thought into word. And when you put things into words, it's very clear if they're correct or if they're invalid. Again, it's all about cognition, thinking, the way you approach problems. You'll come across many different common things like ambiguity, where you leave meaning to interpretation. Everyone's guessing what things do, but it's not explicit or it's not entirely clear. Over complexity, fusing too many ideas together at once, where, where the logic might work, but things are entangled. Or simply just wrong abstraction. You modeled what e what's easy to code, not what's real. Now everything feels like a workaround. Programming itself is structured thought. So on the point of ambiguity, process a job, takes in some job status, does some handling. It's not explicit when I read this function. I have to go into the implementation to see what happens. You know? Or what we could do is we could create an enum. Now it's very clear. What states can our code have? What can happen and what happens for each state? Name your expectations explicitly. This enum is centralizing our shared understanding. On the point of overcomplexity here, nothing necessarily wrong other than the fact you have a massive if statement with loads of different conditions. If you wrote this code, if you're constantly dealing with it, if you know the problem space, maybe this is all very clear, as clear as signing someone in and making sure their username and password is correct. Or what you could do, you could put a hand on it, just pull out the condition and just store it inside a function call. Suddenly it has a name, is retriable failure. This logic wasn't wrong before, but it was just packed into one unreadable blob. But by naming this condition, we give it naming, meaning, sorry, testability and reuse. And now we can ask questions like, what makes a failure retriable? That's thinking. Again, wrong abstraction. We have a job manager where we have different job types like an email or an invoice, uh, or potentially, we just have an email job, an email sender. It's all about feedback loops. Skill compounds through iteration. This is the cognitive loop you are following whenever you program. Think, test, break, refine. It's not just software, it's cognitive. It applies to everything. You're not just fixing bugs in your code. You're refining your own understanding of the problem space. And every time you complete the loop, you get sharper. This talk itself is code. I started off, I wrote this code, I wrote a version of it, I tested it on my friends, saw what they reconstructed in their heads, and I refined it. Again, code, thinking, is a model in itself. Your thinking will have blind spots, but you debug them. And that's what thinking like a programmer means. You don't wait for perfection, you iterate towards clarity. So, overall, don't just debug code, debug thought. Model reality make it explicit, compose clear parts, iterate, and communicate. 
Because programming isn't really about programming. It's about thinking clearly, modeling clearly, and communicating clearly. That's what makes you dangerous. Don't just debug code, debug thought. Thank you for listening.